Good morning, everyone. So good to see you all. Thank you all for joining us in person today for the next step in early childhood policy, creating a universal system of care for families with young children. We're so excited that you're joining us today as a follow-up to yesterday's virtual conference. We're so happy to be back in person and we've built in several opportunities for networking. We'd like you to take advantage of seeing your old colleagues again in person and meeting some new folks. My name is Leslie Babinski and I'm the director of the Center for Child and Family Policy at Duke University. In our virtual conference yesterday, we heard from experts across the country about how to build and support early childhood systems that promote equity and support healthy development. Yesterday, we had over 400 participants who participated an average of four hours throughout the day. We were thrilled with all your engagement and your questions and uh, the discussion that we were able to have with our speakers. In fact, several of our speakers from yesterday are joining us today for the in-person event. Our focus today is on what is happening right here in North Carolina and where we go from here. Joining us today are state policymakers, state agency leaders, researchers, nonprofit leaders, school board members, healthcare providers, and advocates representing communities across North Carolina and beyond. We wanna thank you for your commitment to supporting children and families, and again, we're so glad you're here. I wanna take a minute to acknowledge and thank our speakers and our co-sponsors, the Sanford School of Public Policy, the Hunt Institute and ABC Thrive, Thrive. Next up, I'm pleased to introduce Professor of Public Policy, Dr. Ken Dodge. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, so it's my honor to welcome you all here uh, on behalf of the Sanford School uh, this morning. Uh, the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke University is celebrating our 50th anniversary. The Sanford School was started uh, by Governor Terry Sanford um, many years ago. Uh, you know, and this convening is a great example of what the Sanford School is all about and has aspired uh, to be. Uh, bringing together experts, policymakers, community leaders, uh, stakeholders, advocates, along with students, faculty, staff members within the university to address a pressing challenge and, and what could be more pressing today than uh, families uh, with young children. Um, this is part of Sanford's mission, which is to improve lives and communities uh, by doing research, by teaching students, by bringing the community together to uh, discuss, to forge new ideas, forge public policy. And this conference today is just a perfect example of that. So thank you for being here and participating in it. This conference is you know, very topical and there are a number of other topical events going on year round at Sanford, but also this, this week that we are, are celebrating. Uh, so other events are going on this week. I know there will be a, a lecture by uh, David Gergen um, and Judy Woodruff and, and a number of others. Uh, I hope you'll explore them, find out and participate. Within the Sanford School, uh, this event is organized by the Center for Child and Family Policy. And gosh, what great leadership we have in Leslie Babinski as director uh, of the Center for Child and Family Policy. Uh, and it's, it's one of the Sanford School's signature centers um, and hosts a number of events like this. Um, for this event, we are also very for fortunate to partner with another Sanford School entity, uh, the Hunt Institute. Uh, started by Governor Jim Hunt. Uh, the Hunt Institute became part of the Sanford School in 2016, does a number of very exciting things locally, statewide, as well as nationally, and we're, we're very fortunate to partner with them. And so in that spirit, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Karen McKnight, Deputy Director for Early Learning Programs at the Hunt Institute, uh, who will outline the goals for today's convening. Welcome, Karen. Thank you, Ken. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today representing the Hunt Institute. We're delighted to partner for the Center for Child and Family Policy on this event. The Hunt Institute was created in 2001 by our esteemed four-term governor, Jim Hunt, 
as um, an education policy support to governors, elected leaders, and states. We bring together people and resources to inform elected officials and policymakers about key issues um, along the education continuum from prenatal to workforce, resulting in leaders who are prepared to take strategic action. Governor Hunt has always been a strong advocate for early childhood and was instrumental in creating our, smart, our own Smart Start with the vision to have every North Carolina child start school on day one, healthy and ready to learn. That legacy continues today in the work that we do. Yesterday, we heard from experts across the country about how to build and support healthy development. Today, we turn to what's happening in North Carolina to promote positive outcomes for families with young children. We'll hear about innovations in state government, local communities, and what to expect in the coming legislative session. So, and now I would like to welcome Dr. Lisa Janetian to the stage to introduce our first session. Thank you. Good morning, what a delight to be here today and see all of these wonderful faces. And let me just um, echo the thanks to all of you for your hard work and commitment to supporting children and families um, here in North Carolina. So as our uh, illustrious and modest group gets seated here, I'm going to introduce each of them. <laughs> so our starting panel today, um, I'm gonna begin with Yvonne Copeland. Uh, is the director of the newly formed Division of Child and Family Wellbeing in the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. She has over 25 years of nonprofit leadership and healthcare experience, including managed care administration, quality improvement, behavioral health, government relations, and association management. Thank you for joining us today, Yvonne. Um, Amy Stevens Cabbage is the president of the North Carolina Partnership for Children, starting her career in early childhood education. She went on to work as a National Head Start Fellow for the Federal Administration for Children and Families. Her history as both an early childhood educator and attorney culminated in work with the National Center for Research on Early Education and TeachStone, where she was employed before joining Smart Start. Thank you for joining us today, Amy. Thank you. Ariel Ford is the Director of the Division of Child Development and Early Education for the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Previously, she served as the Deputy Administrator overseeing the City of Chattanooga's Office of Early Learning. She also worked in Delaware's Department of Education, developing state-level systems to improve services and supports for child care programs and educators, and overseeing the statewide Early Head Start Child Care Partnership Grant. Welcome, Ariel. Kelly Kimple is the Senior Medical Director for Health Promotion in the Division of Public Health at the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. She's also the state Title V maternal, or Title V, right? Maternal and Child Health Director. Um, Dr. Kimple works across NCDHHS and with other partners on various initiatives, including the COVID-19 response, immunizations, infant mortality and disparities, maternal mortality, and reproductive life planning, among others. She's a pediatrician and preventive medicine physician. I am going to turn it over to our panelists. Um, I think we have a presentation that will be put up. Okay, great. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so a confession to make. Uh, two, I may have over 25 years of experience. <laughs> Second confession, I was talking with my colleague, Dr. Kimball, and saying that this is the first public speaking engagement I've had since COVID, since the pandemic. So I was used to a script and I could, <laughs> you know, you're doing everything virtually so you can use your script. And now that I'm in person, I'm sort of dependent on my script. So just making that confession and I'm going to see how I do today. So, but so pleased to be here. And my script says, my name is Yvonne Copeland. That's why I just wanted to say that. <laughs> so anyway, my name is Yvonne Copeland. I'm the director of the Division of Child and Family Wellbeing, and I am truly, truly honored to be here with you today on my first you know, public speaking engagement since the pandemic. Um, so I'm gonna share a brief overview of the Division of Child and Family Wellbeing um, so that we can get to the meat uh, with my esteemed colleagues. So, okay, um, first slide please, next slide. I'm gonna look behind me. So the Department of Health and Human Services uh, vision is that all children are healthy and thrive. 
um, as a state agency charged with the protecting the health, safety, and well-being of North Carolinians, um, we want to buy health, not just health care. So Secretary Cody Kinsley charges us every day to think about how we can use our resources um, to go as far as possible toward promoting whole person care, advancing health equity, and improving child and family well-being. Next slide, please. Um, so the Department of Health and Human Services established the Division of Child and Family Well-Being as part of a broader realignment uh, to bolster whole person care, encourage transparency and accountability, and to promote health equity across the department. Uh, Div Division of Child and Family Well-Being, as you can see, is part of the Opportunity and Well-Being portfolio led by Deputy Secretary Susan Gale Perry. It's the purple portfolio led by Deputy Secretary Susan Gale Perry and uh, Assistant Secretary Dr. Charlene Wong, happens to be my direct supervisor. Next slide, please. So the pandemic really um, exacerbated health and economic challenges for families across the nation, and North Carolina is no exception. Um, as the state ranks 10th in the nation for food insecurity, um, as well as having adverse experience or effects of the pandemic, the department has prioritized the well-being of children and families um, using various strategies. And one of those strategies is the establishment of the Division of Child and Family Well-Being. The division was actually established on January 20th, uh, 22 of this year, and we expect the transition to take um, to go well into the next fiscal year, I would expect, because there's a lot of work that goes into standing up a new division, but we have been established. Next slide, please. So, uh, the division brings together complementary, complementary health and human services programs um, from various divisions, the Division of Public Health, the Division of Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities and Substance Abuse Services, as well as the Division of so, uh, Social Services. So brings together programs from all of those uh, separate divisions under one division of Child and Family Well-Being. So the department is leaning in on the integration of behavioral health, physical health, and nutrition programs to provide, again, that whole person care in a coordinated and streamlined manner. I stress coordination, because that's really the key to this work or to the establishment of the division, greater coordination among complementary uh, programs so that we can meet the escalating needs of children and families. Next slide. So what programs comprise, I wanna make sure I'm on the right slide, what programs comprise the uh, Division of Child and Family Wellbeing? We have Food and Nutrition Services, which is also known as SNAP federally. Um, that's part of um, our portfolio. Community Nutrition Services, which is WIC, Women, Infants, and Children, and CACFP, which is a program for children and seniors as well, food program. Early Intervention, which serves children zero to three with developmental delays and whole child health, which is probably our newest section in terms of um, we combined our behavioral health, uh, child behavioral health unit from DMH along with our uh, children and youth branch from DPH to formulate whole child health. Put them together, sort of force the integration a little bit structurally, and um, that seems to be working well. We have um, almost a 1,000 employees that we've transitioned, and um, it's been challenging. But it's also been, <laughs> but it's also been um, exciting at the same time. So next slide, please. We have a couple of priorities. We have many priorities, but two top priorities, what we're going to call sort of our early areas of focus, if you will. And they are to address food insecurity and child behavioral health with an emphasis on prevention and family stabilization. We all know that hunger and food insecurity is associated with developmental delays, behavioral health challenges, academic challenges, chronic illness, um, as well as other uh, conditions. So we're gonna leverage the nutrition, which I'm so excited about, that's new to me. We're gonna leverage the nutrition, prevention, and health programs to increase access uh, and utilization of these programs and services uh, to ch uh, for children and families, and hopefully improve outcomes. So that's the plan. 
Let's talk about, next slide, we'll talk about one of those priorities. I'm actually gonna to touch on two, but I'm most excited about this because the nutrition side is new to me. So really interesting about how this uh, helps to undergird uh, health for all of us. So to advance our goal, to address food insecurity, we're partnering with the Benefits Data Trust, which is a nonprofit, a national nonprofit that's technology and policy based, um, on a state action plan over the next two years to increase SNAP and WIC participation. We have a three pronged strategy, and as I go like this, we have a three pronged strategy to match data across SNAP, WIC, and Medicaid to identify individuals who are eligible but not enrolled in one of the other programs. So then we're gonna analyze that data. We're gonna lean in and find out who's eligible but um, not enrolled population. What does that look like? What does that population look like? We're gonna stratify that data by our key equity metrics, race and ethnicity, urban, rural, disability, et cetera. And then we're going to develop targeted outreach approaches to those populations so that we can increase, you know, hopefully potentially increase um, participation in the programs and enrollment. Finally, and I think I'm very excited about this as well, we'll identify two to three infrastructure um, and systems initiatives to undertake um, that will change systemically um, help help us enroll as many uh, eligible but unenrolled children and families and to help them remain in WIC and SNAP. And we're gonna obviously focus <clears throat> on the Medicaid and CHIP uh, beneficiaries. And some of those changes include some of the flexibilities that we've enjoyed over the past couple of years. We'd like to have uh, to continue to uh, go on permanently, such as simpl simplifying the SNAP application and allowing for recertification online huge factors when it comes to participation. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is our, just a shot of our strategic plan, the Department of Health and Human Services 2021 to 23 strategic plan, but it shows goal five, which a lot of our initiatives uh, fall under, uh, which is to improve child and family well-being. Um, and one of the ways, one of the strategies that we're using in addition to food insecurity, or addressing food insecurity, is addressing children's mental health or behavioral health, particularly in schools and primary care settings. Next slide. So we have another project that we're working on. We've partnered with ASTHO, which is the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, um, as well as we partnered with Department of Public Instruction, the Department of Juvenile Justice under DPS, and others, um, all of our division partners as well, uh, to create a cross-departmental, cross-divisional, unified school behavioral health strategic plan. So we've um, already conducted a landscape and gap analysis. Some of that is still sort of uh, underway, but we are currently exploring the various solutions as though provided evidence-based uh, school behavioral health strategies um, that work. And we can look at the data in terms of expectations um, around what our outcomes might be uh, around those uh, initiatives. So <clears throat> we are exploring those solutions and we're going to work with a lot of external partners, local um, uh, uh, funders, everyone that we can have to weigh in on this because as you know, when it comes to school, behavioral health or anything that we're doing at the school, it's gonna take everybody at the table. So we're going to identify or prioritize some of those strat strategies and that will comprise our unified strategic plan and implementation will occur. We're gonna have key performance measures that we can track our progress and see how we're doing. Um, obviously we're focusing on schools because one of the other things that we've learned as if we didn't know through the pandemic is that kids are at school and they need school, and we need to meet kids where they are. And we know how they suffered without having that support system, whether it was related to food, whether it was related to socialization, whether it was related to um, exposure for identification of things that may not be going right in a child's life. But we know that, so that's why we're prioritizing schools first in terms of that being our area of focus. So, um, last slide wonderful, lovely faces, our team, 
and uh, so proud of, of our team. And as you see these lovely smiling faces, I'm just going to say that this is hard work. Um, you know, and, um, but it is good work. We are so committed to it. We're just at the beginning. We are literally in our infancy. Um, we are not really at the program work yet. At this point, we're still building infrastructure, and that takes a lot. So as you, if you happen to see this model, and you say, oh, every state should do that, I would caution you, as I, <laughs> I would caution you, um, as I would anyone, um, you know, let's get through it and share our lessons learned. Um, it was actually one year this month that I believe Secretary Cohen rolled out this concept mm -hmm. or said that we were going to do this. So one year later, we have established the division. Again, the, to stand it up is gonna take a little more time, but we are eager um, and already started to do, it, to do the good work with all of the partners, so we're really excited about this. And there are only a few states in the country that have um, established a division of child and family well-being, even though the National Governors Association has an entire track devoted to child and family well-being. So thank, thank you, you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great to be here with you all and very appreciative of the lovely introduction and uh, the framing of the conversation by um, Dr. Copeland. I appreciate that so much. Uh, thank you to Duke for having us here. Thank you, Ken. It's a wonderful to be uh, partnering with Duke and for years to partner. Uh, Family Connects certainly um, has been a wonderful partner to Smart Start. I'm Amy Cubbage and I am president of the North Carolina Partnership for Children. And we are the state level organization that is is the backbone or the foundation we hope to be uh, for the 75 local partnerships that make up the wonderful Smart Start system in North Carolina. Um, my mother was an early childhood educator and she would always tell me up to her dying days in 1996, many years ago, she was a, in Ypsilanti just before the Perry Preschool Project and she was at Michigan uh, studying early childhood and um, she, she would always tell me, Amy, there's Michigan and there's North Carolina. And uh, we were in Rhode Island. Uh, and you know, North, uh, New England likes to thump its chest about being so uh, on it with uh, child and family policy. But wow, to be in North Carolina is just such an honor. Um, you all, uh, we all have been pioneering for so long in a bipartisan way. And I'm, I'm just deeply appreciative and honored to be here. Um, I, called my dad on my way here because he's a, pro a professor of communications, now 91, but he, uh, I, whenever I hear a good interview, I'll call him and I said, Dad, did you just hear um, the ambassador from Poland uh, speak to the US? What an outstanding speaker. Yeah, because my dad is, loves public speaking and passionate about rhetoric and debate. He said, he was fantastic. I, I loved it, Amy. Where are you off to? So I told him and he said, what are you gonna say? I said, well, I think at the first and foremost, when I think of how do we build a universal system for family and children's children um, in North Carolina, is that we have this foundation of state level organizations and leaders who are so humble. Dad, it is to a person in North Carolina that I find they are humble because they're mission focused. They are here because they truly want what's best for children and families. I was, maybe you would say, raked over the coals a little bit by our Mideast region of LPAC on Monday and some of the executive directors saying, Amy, you gotta step it up. We need better support from NCPC. And as I wrote my thank you note to this, them this morning after they wrote a, a nice note to me, um, I said, I, I can handle it. I take this very, very, with uh, you know, strong shoulders, but also with humility, because I trust you all. 
I really do. I think that day in, day out, you are doing the work to meet the needs of the birth through five population in North Carolina and in your communities. So our three uh, roles, responsibilities at the North Carolina Partnership for Children is first and foremost to be that support system to our local partnerships to ensure that it's top-notch customer service, uh, that colleagues in the room, I've, Mary Scott over there is our Director of Strategic Initiatives, uh, and there may be others of you, um, but who, that we can answer questions, provide resources, and uh, move forward so you can reach, uh, the local partnerships can meet the needs of young children and families and all who care and educate them um, in equitable ways, in new ways. Uh, uh, second is to be a good state partner. It's so wonderful to be here and meet folks in person. I saw Logan Harris this morning for the first time at the North Carolina Budget and Tax Center and other state level advocates who are uh, uh, Representative Clemens, who I've seen over Zoom for so long, now get to see in person. But we are meeting regularly and building this ongoing broad network and there is no no feeling that uh, from me that a smart start needs to be pushed out uh, over CCRNR, over public health, that we are all working together um, and, and that the resources and the commitment from policymakers to fund this system that we're building that's not perfect yet um, it is, going to, is going to come to be. And then the final one is, um, and I just saw my colleague Sophia Jackson walk in, who's my, the terrific <laughs> chief strategy officer at NCPC, so another one uh, who spoke yesterday. Um, so the final one is to talk and walk the message and the work of the local partnerships. My mentor, Joan Lombardi, uh, would tell me, Amy, when you think you've gone small enough, go smaller. When you think you've, you've gone to the town, the county level, go to the town, town, to the neighborhood, to the street, to the homes. Are you really reaching each child in every community? That's what you strive for. But are we really North Carolina? So um, we'll keep doing that, finding those success stories uh, and alleviating challenges across the state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. Um, next, we'll be hearing from Ariel. Hey, everybody. Ariel Ford uh, with Department of Health and Human Services, Division of Child Development and Early Education. And um, so the work that we do is we are sister agencies to Yvonne. Um, and so what we do is really the part of uh, child and family services that is the licensed child care component. So in DCDEE, we work on everything from our North Carolina pre-kindergarten program to child care subsidies to our child care licensing and regulation. And, and then on top of that, all of the quality initiatives that happen across the state. So our quality rating and improvement system, all of the work happening through the preschool development grant, which I know some of our PDG folks are in the room. So that's things like how do we make sure that families are included in every conversation about early care and education? How do we make sure that we are leveraging the resources around the state as, as most successfully as we can? Um, and then we have partnerships with most everybody in this room, uh, which is super exciting. And I think it goes to the, the tenor of this conversation, which is this is a really dense, strong web. Um, and I was looking at some data from the pandemic yesterday, and we were looking at childcare has not declined in North Carolina in the way it has in other states. We have seen an incredibly strong, stable system over the last two years, which Many, many states cannot say that. And it is, I really believe, and y'all, I'm a North Carolina native. I'm born and raised in Buncombe County, came up in early childhood through a little church-based center in Asheville. So, so I've seen this system grow, right? Like I got in right in late 90s as Smart Start was taking off, as NC Pre-K was an idea. And so I've seen this evolution over my career of how our system is so interconnected and it is so reliant upon the strength of our leadership, how it is so reliant upon the trust of our families. Families know that a five-star center and a four-star center are great, safe, nurturing environments for their children to learn and grow. That's huge. 
that our families trust us with that. And that also is not the same in every community. And so having this tighter connection now with, with you know, nutrition, yeah. with whole family health, something that Governor Hunt foresaw back in the 90s when he put Smart Start into place, seeing this come alive is a gift and an honor. So DCDEE has a specific role in this work, but we also have a very integrated role in this work. We make sure that children have access to our child and um, child and adult food program, so centers and homes are able to get reimbursed for healthy, nutritious meals while they are in the program. We make sure that they have access to health, health and screening tools, so if there's a child who the families are a little bit worried that maybe there's something developmentally um, atypical, we help connect them with resources. So while we are a very specific targeted division, our reach goes wide into the families, and we rely on our partners, on our colleagues across this room to make sure that every family who has a child in licensed care has access to those services. That every family who wants quality early childhood education has access to that. Now, we fall short on that all the time because it's a huge effort, because we are consistently underfunded, um, but that's our goal, that's our mission, and that's what we keep working for all together. Um, I love this group of women up here. I'm so glad to be alongside you, and I will hush my mouth because I could just sing your praises all day long. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. All right. Kelly, you are up next. All right. Well, um, thanks to all of you all for having us. And again, a pleasure to be with my esteemed colleagues here to talk with you all today um, and be back in person with you. Um, I think, you know, it just is such a pleasure to hear about this exciting work, all the work, how it's integrated in each of our role, but really reflecting, I think, in, especially my role when thinking about health promotion and thinking about maternal and child health throughout um, you know, the life course is how do we move upstream? How do we have this comprehensive lens to really address um, the health and well-being of children and families? Because we know that it takes much broader efforts um, as we all are working towards in order to do that. So whether it's working on health and promotion activities, if it's uh, addressing those non-medical drivers of health, addressing education, behavioral health, I mean, these are exciting times to be able to bring together the health and well-being, integrate behavioral health, um, and, and those um, items such as food insecurity, which we've struggled with for so many years. Um, but also trying to make sure we have a streamlined experience for families and children. I think it is so critical that they don't get lost and, and so many challenges throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, which we have learned um, from, to be able to do this work, but making sure not only that they have access to streamlined experience, but the parent, the family, consumer, youth voice is at the center of what we do. And I think that's a commitment that we all have in the work that we do. Um, you know, I mentioned this continuum of maternal and child health and, um, and, and really trying to move upstream and realizing that healthy individuals have healthy pregnancies and healthy babies and healthy families and communities. And, and how do we really look at that through that broad, um, comprehensive lens and, um, you know, structure our systems to do that? Um, we know we have a lot of improvement on an opportunity to improve in North Carolina with our maternal mortality rates, our infant mortality rates, and especially the disparities that we see um, ongoing. And so I think a lot of the work that we've been um, focused on, especially um, with all of our partners around um, with our perinatal health strategic plan, our maternal health strategic plan, but also um, trying to figure out where we can improve the system to prevent preventable de uh, deaths. So I will also mention uh, this week, uh, celebrating Black Maternal Health Week. And so we know that um, black mothers suffer pregnancy-related deaths um, more than three times uh, more than our white mothers. And that is irrespective of education and um, income level. So we know a lot of those are preventable and we have a lot of work to do there, um, which impacts all of our children and families and making sure there's healthy environments um, for uh, families to live in. And the other thing that, you know, we're excited about too, um, you all may have 
heard with the extension of prenatal Medicaid for postpartum women and to improve access and maternal health. And I think, you know, we are so excited and this has a lot of opportunity to increase access but also decrease some disparities but is also just, um, you know, a critical piece of the puzzle but not uh, a lot more work to do with Medicaid expansion and um, increasing access across the board for additional reproductive life planning activities and the health of individuals so that they can um, go on to um, support children and families um, in all that they do. So um, I'm just, you know, as a North Carolinian and, um, you know, being in this role and also just working with so many of you uh, throughout many various initiatives as well as this group up here, appreciate your time today and being, um, and having us here. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. So um, we, we are going to open it up for um, Q&A, thoughts, um, and conversation. But I think I would like to kick off with uh, one observation and to get us warmed up and started. Um, first of all, I want to say just even the language used across this team in how to support families and children has been incredible. Streamlining, partnership, upstream. Um, considering life circumstances. And to me, that feels like a, a remarkable right step in the right direction. Um, you know, I have, uh, most of my professional career is focused on federal policy and the innovation that's happening right here in North Carolina is pretty incredible. And really honoring how children's lives are not in silos, right? Mm -hmm. um, so here's my uh, opening question. Um, two components of children's lives that strike me that are sort of have not been mentioned and I wonder about getting your thoughts is housing security, right? Um, and then economic support, um, you know, across the realm of earnings and income and sort of cash. Um, and I wonder if each of you could just comment about how that kind of does or does not, the complicated nature of that and how it fits in the picture of how each of you are thinking about moving forward in your respective roles. <laughs> I, so, and I think, you know, I mentioned the non-medical drivers of, of health, and I think that that's not, you know, just food insecurity, although I think the focus on WIC and SNAP and that increased collaboration is, is um, you know, a great start to that. But I think in doing this work, we've all um, engaged partners, whether it's from HUD or um, all the, I mean, bringing everybody together. And, and I think that's where we look a lot of these committees, a lot of the structure is realizing who do we have at the table and do we have the people, you know, whether it's business partners and you're talking about paid family leave, you know, do we have um, all of the other organizations that really may have nothing to do with health, but those, that access or that circumstance is what, um, what really is the basis of, of what can support health and well-being. And so I think we, um, you know, we have, um, thought about that, and I've thought about that for, as public health for a long time, of what um, what actually uh, drives health. And as a department, you know, with our healthy opportunities pilots and with the work to focus on that non-medical drivers of health, realizing how much of that really contributes to outcomes, I think that is where we're moving um, to expand that, uh, that vision of health and well-being. Can I add yeah. to that? Okay, so just to piggyback on what Dr. Kimball is saying, and we have to pay for it. Right, mm -hmm. so health plans now, and I think that that's part of Medicaid transformation and the emphasis on uh, paying for the right things. We know about non-medical drivers of health, so we're gonna have to pay for, hopefully they'll be paying for transportation, for housing, or other things like that, which are gonna keep people healthy and are gonna improve outcomes. So there's that payment aspect that's always underlying and undergirding everything, but at least we're here. There was a time when there was a, a huge separation between uh, what we call the medical model mm -hmm. and the behavioral health model. Now we realize that there's no separation and we've also recognized what we always knew on the behavioral health side because you're not gonna be med compliant if you don't eat and you live under a bridge. But um, now there's an acknowledgement of that from the medical, from the health community, from payers and we're seeing uh, more of that coming along. So I think that that's where we have to partner with everyone, everybody at the table, and we'll be able to get this done. But we have a long way to go, a long way to go. And housing is a very difficult problem. I, we just have to say that, right? We would yeah. be remiss not to say that housing, I think, is probably our biggest challenge 
um, of them all, yeah. quite frankly. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. you wanna sure, cool. Um, so I'll speak a little more granularly uh, and to say that, you know, access to high quality early childhood education, early care and learning is economic security. Families cannot go to work unless they have access to high quality early care and learning for their young children. Um, so there's, there's a d very direct correlation be between being able to provide that access to families, especially low and moderate income families. Um, we know the benefits cliff of child care subsidy is devastating for families. So those are things that we think a lot about and are trying to figure out ways to work with our federal partners and our state legislators to solve that cliff. I actually, I actually disagree with my colleague about housing being a terrible problem. I think it's a financial problem that we don't want to pay for it. Mm -hmm. we, know, we know how to build houses, mm -hmm. right? Like we know how to do this. This is, not a, this is a unique problem that we have created. It's a policy problem and it's a financing problem and we just have to have the money and will to do it. So I think it's a sticky problem because we, ha we don't have the money or will to do it right now, which is a terrible thing, but maybe an honest thing to say. Um, I will say, I also just want to give a shout out to our partners at Head Start who have been trying to circle this square for 55 plus years now, who said a family who comes in our door, we're going to help them make sure that they're stay housed. We're going to make sure they have a medical home. So I do think we have a long legacy in our country of, of working with families with young children and trying to make sure that all of those non-medical and medical components of health are met. Um, so just for whatever that's worth, I just don't want Head Start to get left out of that conversation. So I guess that's what I would add, and I think early, kind of what I said before, is a child care center is such a really important place for a family and can be this really amazing connector, just like a pediatrician, right? Like, a family trusts their pediatrician, a family trusts that teacher, they drop their, they put the most precious thing in their life into the hands of another person. And that relationship is really, I mean, I don't know if this is the right word to use in this space, but it is a sacred relationship. When you pass off a baby, your baby, to somebody else, and so that trust um, can lead to those connections being being followed through on and being and the needs of families being met. But that's, I guess, what I would add from my perspective yeah. and the DCDE perspective. And I would only add uh, that something that you said, Dr. Copeland, earlier on uh, flexibility, maintaining flexibility that has been developed during these past two years uh, is really important. We've learned a lot from that. And we were grateful that the General Assembly saw to it to put in the budget 10 million additional recurring funds for Smart Start that did not come with the mandates of how it is used by the local partnerships. It's still very much on my shoulders as and CPC and Sophia's and Mary's and all our colleagues at NCPC to ensure accountability, evidence-based, evidence-improved, but that we trust local communities to do their community needs assessments and then determine how are those many needs of children and families being met. Uh, we still have the bulk of our money being required to be 70% spent on early care and education, and the remaining 30% of our state public dollars uh, can be used on family support, health, um, uh, literacy, et cetera. Um, but we think about that. And as I spent time last week uh, visiting local partnerships and for the week of the young child, um, it was incredible to see the public housing authority there, to see the sheriff there, to see district court teachers, of course, pediatricians, et cetera, um, but ensure that we're really reaching what Head Start, as you said, Ariel, has set for us in that comprehensive uh, goal and services approach from so many years ago. Thank you for raising that. Thank you for all the many thoughtful responses. We know this is really hard work. Thank you. Okay, we're going to turn it to the audience. So. Hello. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I too am really excited about all the collaboration, collaborative words I've heard of partnerships and so on and so forth. Right now, I'm from Cumberland County, Fayetteville, home of Fort Bragg. We are really seeing an economic development boom. Um, in Cumberland County, we have a million square foot Amazon warehouse that's coming that's bringing over 500 jobs. Um, in Lee County, which is just right next door to Cumberland County, there is a new electric vehicle factory that's being built that's bringing over 7,000 jobs. These are wonderful things, 
but where are they going to put their kids? What, what impact is that going to have on the services that are already offered? So while I've heard a lot of conversation about partnerships and collaboration, which is wonderful, I'd like to hear our panelists' thoughts on corporate responsibility as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for elevating it. It is such a critically important piece. If I could just jump in, because we, we must, uh, in North Carolina, point out that some of the attraction to North Carolina, in fact, is our incredible, long-standing commitment across political parties to young children and families. And I don't think we're saying it enough, and we're not holding employers who are coming in and businesses who are attracted accountable for supporting that system and making sure as they come, they understand part of your attraction to this great state is this long-standing commitment and the services that are here that are not going to be able to support without much stronger investment, both from public and private. And, and at Smart Start, you know, you say, well, do, do we need a state level? We need a state level Smart Start because we were formed not to be DCD or DHHS. We were formed to be a public-private partnership. And so we, we are, are doing that. We've been so fortunate to be supported from philanthropy in that way. But we need to grow that support from businesses and employers. So thank you for elevating that. I'd like to, I'd like to add to that. And so one of the things I would, I, you know, I love... You heard that I came from Chattanooga, or Chattanooga was my last role before this, and I had the great fortune of working with two amazing economic development experts, and one of the things that we worked on at the local level, which I think is a lot of economic development happens at the local level. Mm. Yep. Department of Commerce has early childhood education in their strategic plan, so at the state level there's alignment between our, our departments. Um, and at the local level, what we worked on is that every economic development deal started to have early care and learning as a component of it. Mm -hmm. So either they were addressing it through the tax incentive, so maybe part of the tax incentive would go toward early childhood education, or early care and learning programs, or there was some sort of um, uh, commitment to working with neighborhood programs to expand those programs so that they would have access to care in those community programs. So I think that's a really important way that our local communities, and I think Smart Start is a great vehicle for that locally, oh. to have that connection with your county commissioners, your city council, your pl planning, zoning planning and development people to make sure that, that we're not missing childcare. A lot of times we talk about K-12, and as we bring in these things, is there, are there enough schools for our K-12 kids? Well, if you don't have zero to five and before and after school, there's going to be a huge gap. So I would just encourage everyone who is working locally to think about that as a strategy, and I'm happy to be a resource for how that worked in Chattanooga if anyone wants to, anyone wants to talk. And I'll just say, I mean, uh, again, I appreciate you elevating that because I think it's a critical conversation and one that, you know, whether state, local um, level to engage those business partners and having that discussion of, of what it means to invest in your workforce and, yes. and, and incentivize them to do because it can be a good business model to make sure there's child care availability and, um, and policies that support those that work for them. So ongoing discussions and, and again, a continued need to engage our business partners in those discussions to help them, um, to help us all see how we can support children and families in the work that we do, including the business policies and the wraparound supports that we need from economic development. And I don't want to belabor it, but I will just say, just to <laughs> add another, you know, again, this is, I think a lot of this happens at the local level agreeing with everyone else and you know we have to make it known what's important to us as citizens right um, so that when these uh, deals are being made at the local level or at the state level whomever they were bringing um, um, companies to the county that they know that children and family well-being is important to us and how are you going to support that you know what is that going to look like and make that part of the negotiation you know, I, I know that that's, I, it's not impossible. And we have so many, many uh, foundations and philanthropic and socially responsible organizations, and that's wonderful. But we need to hold everyone accountable who's, you know, or have ever, let everyone have some skin in the game. And I think that that's, uh, again, part of a policy and uh, political action, you know, activity that we need to be doing at the, at the local level. And us supporting that as well. Put it on everyone's agenda you know, let it permeate, put it on everyone's agenda. 
Thank you. We have another question. Hi, uh, my question is specifically for Yvonne. During your presentation, I saw that ACEs were mentioned, mm -hmm. and I would like to know um, if you could talk a little more about that and how ACEs play a role in your work and whether or not providers are trauma informed. Wonderful question about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, um, uh, the instrument that measures that, and we know that it's a huge predictor of um, your um, likelihood of experiencing health and behavioral health issues. And ACEs is very much a part of our work, um, very much a part of all of our work. Um, so we are working on some, we are actually a part of the National Governors Association Trauma and Resilience Network, about 10 states that are participating in that network that we are looking at expanding our um, commitment to trauma-informed care, training providers. We already have programs where we train providers on trauma-informed care and all of those things, but we need to amp it up. We need to do more. Um, and there are states now who actually have trauma-informed trauma, um, trauma, in, trauma state plans that permeate not even, you know, that for their whole state, how do we deal with trauma uh, throughout uh, various domains? Um, so we are definitely, the state is, con is uh, committed to it. Uh, DHHS has, you know, um, allowed us to go and participate in this um, network, and we are going to expand, are going to expand it. And I will say that there's a lot of good um, trauma work out there, and we need to get it, uh, get ACEs in primary care settings, right? An abbreviated tool of some sort so that, because primary care is where we're going to catch most of the kids, right? So we need to have that there, obviously, in schools. So there's a lot of opportunity for expansion, and we're working on it. So thank you for bringing that up. We should never have a conversation without ACEs and trauma. <laughs> There we go. I'll push the button and then be able to hear. May, hear. may I ask just to say your name and yes. name? Oh, yes. sure. <laughs> um, Jess Bosquet, Durham County Department of Public Health. Um, and my question, I'm glad you asked the ACEs question because I'll, I'll take another question then. Um, <laughs> the I love seeing the integration, the collaboration, particularly the data to see where families maybe are missing subsidies or other benefits that they could be getting. Um, I was recently looking at our data and most of our patients are actually self-pay. Um, and digging into that, many of them are self-pay because they don't qualify or are afraid to apply for benefits. Um, and so I was wondering how you all, as you're thinking about whole child health, have found, uh, thought about some of our children and families who maybe don't qualify or because of our public charge rules in the past have are nervous to even engage in that system and how we we kind of catch those who may be falling in the through the cracks that way great question um, so the same approach that we're using for the food insecurity we're going to use on the uh, health side so applying that data and looking at where are people eligible but not enrolled in particular for services so that they're not doing self-pay there is very much stigma right, associated with, um, um, you know, going to see if you're eligible for certain services, so addressing that as well. But you mentioned data, and uh, again, shouldn't talk of, have this conversation without ACEs and data. Um, again, the, uh, the data project that we're doing <clears throat> on the food insecurity with BDT, but also we're working on a child <coughs> behavioral health uh, dashboard. Um, so that we can look, we're working with various <coughs> divisions, and departments, external, obviously, DPI, DJJ, some of those same, um, same um, <clears throat> external partners, as well as uh, private sector, uh, to build a data dashboard where we can determine um, where are kids, you know, where are we being effective and where are we not being effective, where are the, where's the unmet need. And we're looking at a couple of domains, school, um, children with complex needs, um, uh, general pop, again, we're trying to get upstream, right? We have to look at general population. Look, where can we have prevention and intervention strategies? Um, and of course, I, the last one escapes me. But, and we're hoping to have that <coughs> dashboard completed by the fall. But very good, have to be data informed. Can I add, can I add? so I think something that I have experienced at the state level and the local level is that state policy can be as good as it can be, right? Like we can have as many kind of inclusive 
um, pro-family, and I mean that in a that's not the right word. Anyway, uh, policies as we want, and, and the way that those trickle down is where I think there oftentimes becomes a gap. So it might be that social worker that they come into contact with missed the training day, right? Like it can be as something as simple as that. So I think it's the onus is on us as state agencies to continue to do professional development, uh, you know, push out information to make sure that our our colleagues at the local level have everything they need to have to implement the policy successfully and then to, for the local level to be able to filter back up to us that that bi-directional relationship um, is strong so they can say okay you have this great this actually happened to me okay you have this great policy but this document on your website is kind of mean and I was like oh you're right that that is a very governmenty document you know and it's supposed to be a child care facing document so to have the, a local, someone in a local community be able to share that and not think that I, there will be retribution or I'll be angry at them, but just to say like, as something as simple as, yeah, your website has documents that are kind of mean. Like that matters, right, in a local community because somebody gets that document and they're like, well, DCDE hates us. And then that trust is broken where changing the document, changing the font, whatever it is, thank God there are graphics people can make that relationship um, that touch point a little bit softer and more accessible. So I think there's a bi-directional relationship that has to exist between our local partners and the state agencies, including this, and I think yeah. Smart Start yeah. does that really well between your locals and, and well, the state agencies. I did too. mention getting raked over the coals well, by <laughs> LPAC the other day. <laughs> but they trust but, you to do that, but right? But they trust me, that is yeah. true. Yeah, I think that that comes with that humility at the state level to say we're not perfect, we're not always getting it right and we really need to be open to hearing that feedback and to making changes from local partners. They are the ones doing the work, implementing mm -hmm. on the ground that know their communities best, um, know the needs for resources and for flexibility and for finding it in every way we can. And we, you know, bang up against compliance and accountability a lot, but we need to elevate uh, the innovative ways that you can reach children and families and uh, and, and that we, we have to do it, that it, we have the moral ground to do it. So. And I just wanna say thank you for raising the trust issue. I think we have a lot of work to do. Um, it doesn't matter how streamlined you make the process if people don't wanna walk in the door to mm -hmm. actually get that care. So how do we work, um, you know, with our, whether it's through uh, professional development activities, um, you know, at various levels to ensure that people are treated the way that they should be treated and they have that trust to reach out when they need assistance or services um, to access those. And I wanna go back to the data. I totally agree with that. Um, I wanna go back to the data that, and the local, we need to push that data down for the locals because you've seen one county, you've seen non one county, yeah. and they're all, not all resourced the same. Some don't even have the ability to, um, to analyze their own data. So I think that that's where the power of the data, of knowing what's going on in your own community will be helpful. So the dashboards that we're creating are external facing. You know, and we need to get them to each community. So they're gonna be state level external, but we need to also get them to each community so they'll know what's happening in their own communities. Cause some, you know, can do it and some cannot. So that's gonna be very powerful. I just wanna take a moment and I'll go to the next question cause I think this will build off this conversation. We've been talking a lot about sort of top down and trickle down in terms of responsibility and layers of government. I wonder if each of you could comment also, you know, one of the themes we heard yesterday over and over again is how do we bring families and individuals to the table and make this a shared partnership, right? With families and individuals. Um, and I wonder if that conversation is happening for you know, each of your respective organizations. And you know, that's a very challenging thing to do, going back to trust. Mm -hmm. Well, how do we know eligible families or families who are seeking um, are interpreting it that way? How do, we, how do we learn that? How do we adapt to that? How do we make this a shared partnership with families? Well, this is another thing I feel strongly about. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, so because com you know, coming from an advocacy perspective, right? And there used to be an adage, nothing about us without us. And that's the way it should be. Um, however, it's hard to do. And I don't know why, I think because the work 
has sort of an inertia and an energy of itself and you're just sort of going on and doing the work, but we need to have families by our side with us doing that. And it's something that we're committed to with, the, you know, because we're new, we're gonna get to like make commitments and, you know, and try to establish new things. And it's something that we're really committed to, but that means that we're gonna have to pay people, right? You cannot expect people to participate in your job and them to do it for free. <laughs> so we need to provide, you know, uh, resources for them to be there side by side with us doing this work. And I'll, I'll leave it there, but. And we can talk after over coffee, if you like, about that. Because I would love to know if there are, um, honestly, if there are streams where we can access people, if that makes sense. Because, um, you know, we know that there are certain groups and we engage them, but where do we just get people? Where do we just get people? In addition to the groups. And, I, and I'll just add, I mean, in addition to investing, I mean, we've had a long history of, of family partners and, and investing and, and paying for their work um, to do, but also making sure we do it in a family-friendly way, um, you know, knowing that a lot of them may have um, child care, you know, children with special health care needs, that they're, you know, trying to figure out when they can participate. Are we having weekend meetings to accommodate, evening meetings, those kind of things, where it's not just the ones that, um, you know, they may not have, they're not working during the day, so they can't participate even if they were paid. So I think it's just really having that lens and making sure that there's um, structures in place to facilitate those, um, the, the family structures to be able to pull in those people with lived experience and be able to pull in partners, family partners and consumers and really across the board and, and all the work that we do. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, uh, to your point, Yvonne, streams, community colleges. I am Cindy Osborne. Thank you. <laughs> she, has yes. to, she has to remind me. Um, I'm Cindy Osborne, and I'm with the North Carolina Access, the community college faculty group, and I'm the chair. Um, I'm also at Stanley Com Early Childhood Faculty case we didn't know. Um, but for the past three years, I wanted to go back to the ACES conversation. We've been working for your other partner with Duke, the Center for Child and Family Health. Um, and they, um, we've been working with faculty to train us on trauma-informed practice. And we are embedding content into three of our courses, um, EDU 119, Child, Family, and Community, and Health, Safety, and Nutrition. Um, we are in the fourth phase of this work. We have five funders across the state helping us to embed this content, train faculty, including adjuncts, um, to make sure that we're getting that word out about ACEs, but as well as trauma-informed practice into the hands of providers. So I just wanted to comment on that, um, but I don't really have a question. I just want to <laughs> applaud you for that work. That is amazing. Well, and for people that who don't know, EDU 119 is a required course for anyone who is a, a lead teacher, regardless of star level in the in the state. So that is that is truly monumental that every person who is a lead teacher, regardless of the, the star level of the program, will have that in their, for their very first inaugural course. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I always like to celebrate community colleges because I think you often get it more than anyone else that you got to have those folks who are doing that work yeah. nurtured aware and their mental health and well-being cared yeah. for yeah. and you look at that you're st you bring that uh, approach and perspective on your students um, that you expect them to mirror and reflect as they go into these or are already in and working students so often working with students exactly yeah. Yeah. yes yeah. that have all those needs and resources and ideas though and brilliance of the lived experience. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, Phil Redman, Program Officer with the Duke Endowment. Uh, thank you all for participating in the panel. Uh, two, two questions. One, I really appreciate the conversation and the use of words like collaboration, cooperation, partnership. 
and yet those aren't new ideas. <laughs> and so I'm wondering from a data standpoint, from, for someone who's looking outside of the government structure or the quasi-government uh, structure, what evidence would I see that there's actually authentic collaboration among the government partners that's different now than it was 2019 or 2018? What's, what's the data you would point to me to say that we are collaborating across our divisions to do things differently? And then secondly, um, again, from a government structure standpoint, We've got the opioid settlement, we've got the ECAP, we've got your respective strategic plans. We have a number of goal, goal plans that everyone's trying to adopt and roll out. And I'm curious from your perspective, what is the strategy from the government structure standpoint that understands there's a certain urgency to these questions and to these issues, children and families can't wait, and yet how do we slow down enough in order to get it right in the end? How do we combat this, this necessity, both politically and socially, to, to get things out to children and families and combat this tendency just to get the money out, get the program started without thinking about the infrastructure that's going to be needed to do it well, to get it right, so that we don't waste this opportunity that we have now to uh, really impact children and families long term? Either one of those questions, because it may it may be too much. But uh, for a short, I apologize for that. But that's I, that's what's on top of my brain right now. Could I, I take first step? Yes. This? Okay. So I want to give an example um, to the first part of your question about how would you know? And I think it's too. I'll give a concrete example, which is, um, and I don't have the data point right in front of me, but uh, when pandemic EBT came through, um, there was an entire team that worked on how should we get this to the most kids possible across the state. And so through a collaboration with DCDE, through public health, through folks who are now in Division of Child and Family Wellbeing, more children in North Carolina were able to access um, EBT than, or families were able to access EBT than have ever been before. And so I think that is a concrete example. The second thing I would say though is uh, while quantitative data is, is a requirement and we should always be looking for it. Qualitative data often tells us things that the numbers can't. And it tells us things that the numbers are lagging on sharing. So I would just encourage us to not only look at the numbers, but also to listen to the lived experiences of peoples and people in communities to make sure that we aren't missing something that is really uh, accelerated or happening well or or the opposite, right? And so I would just encourage us to remember that there's multiple ways to collect, analyze, and use data. So that's kind of thing one. And and um, I can't remember actually the second part of your question. So anyway, that was just, I just feel really passionately about how we use this, the lived experience of people who are most impacted by our decisions to help guide us not only what the numbers tell us because those two together are a way more accurate representation than one alone. Errol, it was a question about uh, balancing urgency with oh. slowing down so that we m make sure it's, we don't miss the opportunity. They're related answers. So the other thing is I think something, I, I actually just want to brag on DCDEE because one of the things that we have really worked hard on is how do we listen to the needs of our, of our child care community. I will say Zoom has helped with that immensely. So in our, um, we have to do a, a child care development plan every several years. And so we were able to get over 1,100 people to participate in that. And they also shared with us, you know, what do you need? What is working? What isn't? What things do you need more modifications around? And so the answer to the urgency versus slowing down question, I think, is really around how are you making sure that you are in constant communication with your community to make sure that you are uh, listening, you're taking that into account, you're trying to translate lived experience into policy, which is actually super hard, but really important. And so then I think there's less of a gap between moving fast and moving purposefully. When you know what people are experiencing and need, um, those, those merge much more successfully, I would say. That's my mm -hmm. perspective and experience. Maybe we can call those strategic pauses. <laughs> <laughs> Or not, or you just adapt, right? Or it's, you know. 
Uh, yeah, continually adapting. And um, no, Phil, I appreciate, I mean, all those questions. I'm sure that's a much longer conversation, but I do want to just emphasize, I mean, you know, we've been trying to be collaborators and like you said, this isn't new, but I think we're really being intentional about the way we structure ourselves in addition to, you know, culture change and just the forced expectation that like, you know, we got to, everybody's got to come together to do the work. And we did that um, and had to do that with the COVID-19 pandemic, whether it's nutrition, education, you know, um, vaccine, all of that, we had all hands on deck. And so it is really how we structure ourselves to do the work, how we meet, who we engage, that I think is different, um, you know, including just for like maternal and child health. I mean, a steering committee that we come together and we meet monthly to make sure that we are aligned and we know what the other, of the other group is doing. And so it is an intentional, I think, reflection of how do we structure um, with this reorganization to make sure that, um, you know, that we're setting ourselves up for success to do that. And, and yes, it's hard work. Um, we know collaboration's hard work, especially when it's meaningful. So we're committed to continuing to do that. I, that both, well, Bill, uh, <laughs> I'm not surprised he posed those questions. They are both difficult, at least for me, to wrap my head around in terms of the answer, and I agree with my colleagues. But I think that it, it causes me to um, be more intentional when you say, "What evidence do we have? Will I have? Will we have? What metrics or what evidence? It doesn't have whatever evidence it is that collaboration worked." You know, and I, you know, without really knowing and with that with doing collaboration right there are a couple of indicators that I that come to my mind one is shared priorities right because when you have so many different entities and partners doing different things you get the shotgun effect you know everybody's you know as opposed to a laser focus you know with everyone investing their energy in the same place using the and, and in a very similar plan if not hence the unified strategic plan and then we should see some impact by way of outcomes so that's theoretical you know that's what i'm thinking but that's where we're trying to go that's why and 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 quite honestly i don't like the word collaboration because you know i've done it for over 30 some years, you know, and, um, but you're right. And I think it challenges us, challenges us to have evidence of this collaboration. And, and I, and I think that that's, you know, what we're going to have to do. So I appreciate, I don't have an answer for the question other than, you know, sort of what I just said, and that's what we're doing. So that's our approach to it. We're all going to come together, and that's why the lived experience piece is so important, and it kind of goes to what Ariel was talking about, you know, but that lived experience, and that's where I think we don't even scratch the surface. We don't even scratch the surface, and, uh, you know, and we've got to do better. You know, we don't scratch, and because if we had them by our side, I guarantee you we would do the right thing. No different than having your consumer, you know, your, the, you know, telling you what they want and us buying it or built, you know, building it or making it or, you know, whatever. So I, I you know, very good thought provoking question and without an yeah. answer, but thank you for it. I thank you for it. And yeah. I, I appreciate, oh, sorry. No, I'm no, just going to say again, I appreciate the thinking because I'm even just trying to think about how we structure it. And then you, you get to these outcomes. Like infant mortality, if I could tell you what made that go down, <laughs> I'd be like jumping up and down and we'd all be doing it over and over again. But I think it's also, it's more complex than that. Like there's so many moving pieces that, that um, you know, it, it really is, um, you know, a challenge for us to be able to think about what can we look at from a program evaluation standpoint? What can we look at from what, how we're making an impact? How do we look at those outcomes? How do we look at the evidence to be able to say what works and what can we improve upon? And that's why the collaboration is important because we may not, I'm just saying, we may not see what made infant mortality um, go down, but because everything's a system, but there may be one of our partners who can say, this happened, look at this metric, this is what attributed to that. 